chapter 11, the river to the sea. I'll show you the picture, see if you can spot the ducks. I think there are ducklings too. See? I meant to ask Hattie questions about the garden, Tom wrote to Peter, but somehow I forgot. He always forgot. In the daytime, in the kitson's flat, he thought only of the garden, and sometimes he wondered about it, where it came from, where it, what it all meant. Then he planned cunning questions to put to Hattie, that she would have to answer fully and without fancy. But each night when he walked into the garden, he forgot to be a detective, and instead remembered only that he was a boy, and this was the garden for a boy, and that Hattie was his playmate. There was always so much to do in the garden. They were to build a tree house in one of the yew trees as soon as Hattie could spy out some floorboarding for them. In the meantime, there were bows and arrows. Hattie had said wistfully that Hubert and James and Edgar used to play at forest outdoors with bows and arrows made in the garden. Why didn't you, ask Tom? Oh, they said I was too young, and then, when I was old enough, they said they were too old. Well, why didn't you play by yourself? You could make your own bow and arrows. I couldn't. I didn't know how. At least, I think I know how to make arrows, because James once showed me. They are easy, but not a bow. Then Tom told Hattie to get a sharp knife. She went indoors and came back with a kitchen knife hidden under her pinafore. Directed by Tom, she hacked free a suitable stave of yew. It was unseasoned wood, but they could not help that. Then Hattie trimmed it roughly and notched it round at either end with a bowstring. She was clumsy with a knife at first, and Tom had to even to explain to her about cutting away from herself for safety. When a used stave was ready at last, Hattie found that she had not the strength to bend it and string it. Tom could not help her, and in the end she went to Abel. Before stringing her bow for her, Abel examined its knife work. You did this, Miss Hattie? Yes, indeed I did. Aye, but who taught you to do it? Someone? Well, whoever it was taught you, take care he don't you teach you trouble with it. Trouble? Trouble for yourself, Miss Hattie. Abel gave her a long stare, which Tom, watching from a distance, could not understand. Then Abel, Abel strung the bow as Hattie had asked. Arrows were easy to make, and Hattie, as she had said, knew how. She sought out the straight, unknotted ones from among the old wood of the nut stubs. One end of each hazel wand she trimmed and then notched to fit onto the bowstring. The other end she capped and weighted with a shorter piece of elder. The cousins as always used elder, it seemed. You pushed the tip of the arrow into the elder pith until it held safe. Tom wanted to have the arrows feathered, but Hattie was impatient to use them as they were, and Tom gave way. His only grief was that he could never shoot the arrows for himself. However, he gave advice. He wanted Hattie to shoot at birds, but she refused, although, as he pointed out with truth, there was not the slightest danger of her ever hitting them. Instead, Hattie shot up into the air. She liked to shoot, and then screw up her eyes and watch the thin arrow of the uh, line of the arrow against the dazzling blue of the perpetual summer sky. They lost four arrows in the treetops from Hattie shooting upwards at random, and then a fifth arrow fell through the greenhouse roof. The only witness of the accident fortunately was Abel, and he seemed to be on their side. In silence he fetched a broom to sweep up the broken glass, and a ladder and a spare pane of glass and some putty. When he had done the repair and he had come down the ladder again, <laughs> sawing wood again, ignore that. Um, when he had done the repair and come down the ladder again, fear lifted from Hattie like a cloud. Tom could see that. Thank you, she said to Abel. Aunt won't even know. No, said Abel. Then he said with deliberation, but do you remember what I told you of? It was not a question. It was not an order. Rather, it was a warning, heavy foreboding. You mean, said Hattie after a moment's thought, about being taught trouble? Abel simply nodded and walked away. The next trouble they got themselves, or rather Hattie into, was something from whose consequences Abel was powerless to say. The trouble had its first cause far back in their anxiety not to do more damage in the garden by arrow shooting. 
To avoid that, Hattie started a practice of shooting over the garden hedge into the meadow beyond. Then she and Tom would worm their way through the hedge tunnel to retrieve their arrow. They did no harm by going over the meadow, for it was already grazed close by cows. The search rather held up the archery, but Tom enjoyed the expeditions. So did Hattie. And once the arrow was found, the river that bounded the meadow drew her like a charm. She even braved the geese in order to reach the river bank. The geese had goslings with them now, and always fought a spirited rearguard action in their defence. Tom and Hattie did not want to drive them, but they did want to re reach the river. They advanced slowly, Hattie slightly in the rear, the goslings steered far ahead, squeaking and making for the river, and the two geese went with them. And then, last of all, came the gander. He lurched along, his voice calling angrily. The feathers of his long neck rutted with anger, his head turning now to one side, now to the other, so that one eye was always backwards looking on his enemies. Every so often he would slew round altogether and raise himself high to front them, and then suddenly drop his head and neck forwards and down, almost level with the ground, and begin a snake-like run at Tom hissing. It was always Tom he ran at, because by then Hattie would be well behind Tom and concealed by him as far as was possible. The gander's run stopped short of Tom. He sheared off at the last instant and went back to his waddling. He caught up with the geese and goslings and followed them on the lookout as before. By this process, the whole gaggle in time reached the river and launched themselves upon it. Then they swam up and down in the water, the elders squawking protests, the goslings rather forgetting the danger they were supposed to have been in. Tom and Hattie sat down on the riverbank and wandered by it. Hattie loved the river, but Tom was not very much impressed by it. He had seen other, bigger rivers. Hattie had not. Oh, this isn't big for a river, he said, and it looks shallow and it has weeds in it. But Hattie, facing downstream, would say, you should see it farther down. Have you, asked Tom. No, but I've heard tell. The boys bathe in this only a little farther downstream, where there are pools, and they fish. It gets bigger as it flows downstream. It flows down to Castleford, and then it flows to Ely, and then it flows down and down into the sea at last, so they say. All rivers float into the sea, said Tom. But it was this particular river, the only one that she knew, that interested Hattie. She gazed eagerly downstream as though she envied the waters their endless journey. And sometimes, Tom, the river is big, even here. Sometimes, in winter and spring, there are floods, and then the water brims right up the banks and overflows them, and comes flooding over this very meadow. Hattie, said Tom curiously, if you like this river, why don't you go bathing in it where the others do? Or why don't you paddle and wade here? Or you could get a boat and go downstream for yourself and see where the river goes to. Hattie looked at Tom startled and said that she wasn't allowed in the meadow at all just because of the river running by it. Her aunt said she might get her clothes muddied or wet or, most troublesome of all for everybody, she might even manage to get herself drowned. Reminded in this way of her aunt, Hattie would jump up in a frightened flurry and say she must get back into the garden, and nothing that Tom could say would dissuade her. She made her way quickly back over the meadow to the gap in the hedge. Tom followed. As the two of them left the riverside, all the geese and goslings came to land again and clambered onto the bank. The three elders, and especially the gander, watched Tom and Hattie sharply. On each occasion, they were there to see them take the secret way through the hedge. The geese could not exactly be blamed for what followed. No, if anything, the arrow shooting was to blame. The geese simply used their beady eyes to see the way that Tom and Hattie went with the retrieved arrow, and then later went that way themselves. Their motive was almost certainly curiosity and greed. Kitchen garden greed, not malice. That's the end of chapter 11. Chapter 12 is called The Geese. So, I wonder what the geese get up to in the garden. I think it probably involves something eating, the, eating something they shouldn't. <laughs> Let's find out next time.